Is it recording? Yep, it's recording. Make sure the audio is off or you get an echo. Okay, so that should be recording, and I'll just uh, I can just upload it straight to YouTube. Okay, um, second, I graded everybody's homework this morning. So the way I did that was I graded it, and then I just responded in the email to the email you sent me with grade colon usually uh, a fraction which is equal to one. Uh, a few people missed a little bit, but most people got full credit. Um, if you submitted your homework and you get anything back from me, then that indicates some sort of bug, and you should um, report it by emailing me. Okay? Um, and in the course, so always in the past, we've always had a big deal with, you know, how do you name your worksheet? Because I'm going to take all the worksheets that you send me and load them into a copy of Sage, and I need to be able to see your name and the homework assignment and so on. But this morning, I just wrote this program that goes through my um, inbox. It goes through the folder that corresponds to this homework assignment and then just reads your name and your email address and so on from the message and then changes the title of the worksheet based on that. So you don't have to worry about any of that. Just um, It's useful if the subject has at least the homework assignment in it because then I can put, it's easier for me to know which label to apply to your message, but otherwise it's very straightforward. You don't have to worry about at all what your assignment is named. Um, and by the way, the naming, that's this thing right here, this link, where it says click to rename this worksheet. If you do want to name your worksheet in a meaningful way, you can click there and change this. Okay. And by the way, like one person didn't do this, but save worksheet to a file will give you a .sws file, which you can then um, download. And it'll just save to a local file on your computer, and then you can send it to me. Okay. So that's the first thing. Um, what we're going, oh, any questions before we go further? Okay, um, reminder, I have office hours tomorrow in my office from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And my office is um, Pedelford C423, um, office hours Thursday from 11 to 2. We're also going to have a coding sprint. In case you just want to sit somewhere and work on sage related stuff where other people are, um, from probably about 2 to 5 in Belford C401. This is partly because I didn't organize a sage seminar for this week. So if you want to go to that, you can. Um, so not every single person in the class could because there's not enough room in the class or in that room, but it's pretty good. So um, feel free to go. This is tomorrow also, let's see. Uh, let's see, anything else? I don't think so. Um, so yeah, reminder that feel free to drop by my office hours. Otherwise, I'll just be sitting there bored twiddling my thumbs. So um, come by. Uh, and of course, reminder, your homework is due on Friday, which had two problems, one with a whole bunch of questions about that are just programming questions, and the second is about your final project to kind of get you going in that direction. OK. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is further stuff along the lines of Sage development. And um, first, before really diving into Sage development stuff, I'm going to talk about how to uh, edit a complete, potentially large file in the Sage notebook how do you attach that file to a running Sage session, or how to import it if you want. So this is kind of intermediate between doing full Sage development and working on the core Sage library and uh, using a notebook. So just to emphasize the intermediate part, here's a Sage worksheet. which you think of as typically a bunch of input and output cells. Um, and then something kind of intermediate to that is working on a file, so file.sage, and then there's working on the core Sage library. So you have these kind of three different things. So I will briefly talk about this right here. Um, there are a few things that are slightly rough involving this. It's slightly awkward. And um, it's not, I don't think it's clearly documented exactly how to do this. So pay attention for a few minutes and you'll see how to do this. Um, I believe that the awkwardness can be removed, but 
it hasn't been done so yet, although I hope it will happen in the next couple of months. All right, so um, I wrote some stuff down and gave an example of this in this Sage worksheet, and there's an attached file. But um, what I want to do is I'm going to just make a brand new clean worksheet and do all of this step by step so you can see it from start to finish rather than me just saying, oh, I did something um, because you because I might forget to tell you a step, and this way you'll actually see each thing. Um, so if you download or look at the worksheet right now, then you would see kind of the finished product after you do this. So I'm going to make a brand new worksheet and illustrate uh, how you can work with files in the Sage Notebook. You don't, This is, an, again, just something you can do over a browser. Um, by the way, actually, just I noticed an iPad. Um, there's... Somebody has written an iPhone app for Sage and released it, I think, the day before yesterday or yesterday. So if you use an iPhone or an, um, it's only, it's sort of not optimized for iPads yet, but if you use an iPhone, um, then you just search for Sage Space Math in the App Store and you'll find the Sage app, which looks kind of like this. You probably can't see that, but um, just Sage Space Math. And it's actually pretty nice. You have um, a whole bunch of individual cells and you can, it's, you click on one of them, and then you enter code, and then you'll see the output, and you can do plotting and so on. And it's, it doesn't install, you know, three gigabytes of Sage on your phone. It uses a remote server, but it's a remote server that's optimized for just evaluating the input in one cell. It's called the Sage cell server that it uses behind the scenes. So, um, so is there Sage for Android? Yes, there's also a Sage app for Android that was released about a week and a half ago. So you can look at that as well. Um, which maybe you can even see it because my, my Android device is bigger. Um, so I'll hold that up as well. And of course, both of the apps are free. The one for the iPhone is more well-developed and works differently. They're written by two completely different people. Um, but the one for, the, for Android has better native support for Interax, or has support for Interax. So I don't know. Let's see. This one's, there's really not much to see actually with this one. When something cool looking appears, I'll, I'll show you. Um, but that's the, so that's the Android app. It has little sliders and stuff and you can do interacts on it, some of them at least. And you can enter a bunch of code at the top. It has some support for like for loops and so on so you don't have to type them in little by little. So there are now free apps for both Android and iPhone just so you know, um, that are both in the last week and a half or so. Okay, so going back to this. So first, just a quick overview. There are three uh, really important commands if you want to work with files and Sage. And those commands are load, attach, and import. Okay. Um, load and attach are things that are special to Sage. And import is just a, a, a general Python keyword. Um, and now just a quick overview. The way import works is you say import and then a file name dot. So import and then some um, valid identifier, basically, which can possibly have dots in it. I guess it's not a valid identifier. But import and then something, some module name or file name or something like that. Um, not being precise, sorry. But import then something. Okay, um, Where the something is either a file that ends in .py, that is a Python file. It can also be certain types of shared object libraries, so it could end in .so, um, or possibly .dylib, depending on your operating system, or maybe .dll. So there are various things that can go here, or it could be a whole package of Python code, which is directories and subdirectories and so on. Um, this is a general mechanism for importing stuff. Um, and there's also various syntaxes like from, module name, import something. Um, but by default, if you do something simple like import foo, and there happens to be a file foo.py in the import path, then what this will do is it will uh, evaluate the code in foo.py, and it will create a new namespace under foo. So if you do foo.tab, you'll see all the functions that are defined in that file, all the classes that are defined in that file, etc. So that's the kind of three-sentence description of import. But it's a pretty complicated thing, and of course I'm going to show you some examples in a minute. But basically, import something. Makes it so now something.tab will show you lots of new functionality. So it's nice because it gives you a namespace that contains all the code that you've imported. 
which is very nice. Load and attach, on the other hand, these are conceptually pretty simple. Um, they take, basically, they're exactly the same except um, attach is exactly like load, except if you change the file, it automatically re reloads it. Okay, so that's the only difference between load and attach. Uh, now I have to tell you what load is. So what load, what you do with load is you do something like this, load uh, foo.sage, say, uh, this can be in quotes. And what it will do is it um, takes the file foo.sage, and it's almost exactly the same as taking that file and pasting it in to your running Sage session. So there's no namespace that's created called foo or anything like that. If you were to put something like, uh, I don't know, a equals five in here, load that file, then suddenly a would be equal to five. Okay, so it's really, conceptually load is very simple. All it is is just like pasting the code exactly into your running session. And attach is just like load, except every time you change the files foo.sage and save it, attach automatically reloads the file before you evaluate any additional code. Okay, now let me just illustrate all of that to you in the notebook with a new clean notebook. So I'll go file, new worksheet. So we have a brand new worksheet, um, 1062 illustration of load, attach, import. And now I need a file, and this is where um, you might be surprised at this functionality. It's not, I think, clear from the documentation that this is how things work. Um, I hope that changes, but um, here where it says data, let me make this huge so that it makes a better impression. When you click on the little data thing, there's a little link that appears, or a menu item, upload or create file. And if you select this, then you can upload or create a file. So let's click on it. And now, upload or create a data file. You can either choose a file by clicking on choose file, and that will allow you to upload an arbitrary file from your computer, which will then be attached to this worksheet. So if you have a bunch of data about radiation in um, Japan or something, then you can upload that file, and it will then be part of this worksheet. A worksheet can have hundreds of files attached to it. They're just encapsulated as part of the worksheet. This is um, often useful because then when you save the worksheet, those files go along with the worksheet. And so the worksheet will work for other people. So I'm not going to do that. Um, but another similar thing you can do is you can enter the URL of a file on the web. If there's some file with some data or something out there, or a program or a zip file, whatever you want to mess with, if it's somehow something that you can download via a URL, you can put that URL in here. And then Sage will, the Sage server will grab that file off the web and put it inside of your worksheet. Okay, so that's another useful thing to do. Um, but that's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do is enter the name of a new file, and that file will now be created, and it's part of the worksheet. Think of it as being inside of the worksheet. So let's see, what do you want to call the new file? Let's make up a file that ends in .sage. Somebody come up with a name that ends in .sage. Whoever first gets the name. Sagey file. What? Sagey file. Sagey file. Like that? Okay. Maybe it should be IE. I don't know how to spell Sagey. Does anybody know how to spell Sagey? Okay. <laughs> All right, that's cool. All right, so now what do you want to call it if different? Well, it's kind of silly. Oh, I should call it dot .sage. Oops. Okay, so sage underscore y dot sage. What do you want to call it if different? Well, we don't want to call it something different because we're making it from scratch. I don't know what happens if you do call it something different there. That would be really silly. Um, I have a bad feeling that if, we did, if I did that, there would be a bug or something, because who would ever test that? Um, so now, <laughs> upload or create data file. So finally, we just click this button. Whoops. And it now created a new file. Let me make it a little, you have to zoom out a little here. Okay, so now we have a new data file. And if you look under the data menu, you'll see that it's listed there. If you want to get back to this file to edit it or look at it, then you click on this. You can also delete the file by clicking here. Or if you want to make it so that that file appears to also belong to other worksheets, you can select those worksheets here, and then there'll be a link to this file in the other worksheets. So you can have several different worksheets that share the same file. And it really is the same file. If you edit in one of them, it's edited in any of the others. OK. Um, oh, one other thing just occurred to me. One special feature of load and attach is I think you can give them a 
I'm not even sure if this is true. I think you can give them a URL, so you can have a .sage file on the web, and obviously attach can work. Never mind, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but I think it is. I, often I um, don't know what I actually implemented or what I just thought of implementing and figured out how to do it in my, my head, so sometimes I have to try working on Sage for too long. Okay, so here's a file. We have uh, line numbers. It's really nice. You can edit. It's all syntax highlighted. Um, so let's define a function in Sage underscore y. Maybe we'll call it y. Um, I'm just going to make up some sort of random function. It'll take three inputs. And I don't know, have it print the three inputs. Maybe have it um, multiply them together and add one. OK. And let's save the changes. So when we save it, the file's still there. We can edit it further. I have no idea why the line numbers disappear. That's really stupid. Um, huh. All right, the, there's a bug, obviously. The line numbers disappear after you, you save the file. It's odd. Oh, I see. The problem was that the zoom, it was zoomed in so much that you couldn't see the line numbers and they got pushed off to the side. Probably I could have just scrolled to the left to see them. So they're still there. They're just off to the side. Okay. So now you're probably wondering, how can I actually use this file? So you could imagine, you know, putting thousands of lines of code in this file, et cetera, et cetera. How do you use it? So you could click on worksheet, but that's a little annoying because then the file disappears. Watch. Now you don't see the file anymore. What you'd like to be able to do is sit there and edit the file at the same time use it in a worksheet. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to go back to the file um, by just clicking data in the file name. If you um, open the worksheet tab and if you go open link in new tab, then you'll have the worksheet at the same time. So you see that I can edit the file here and I have the worksheet over here. And now I can do the following. Attach and this is where it gets weird. I have to say data plus sage underscore y dot sage. Notice that there is a hint to remind me that that's the sort of thing I would have to do. It really says data plus that. Here data is a string. It contains the directory in which all of these files attached to the worksheet are stored. Just to um, give you a sense of what that looks like um, before I attach the file. Actually, I'll use load first because it's a little simpler to understand. Um, the directory is just some big absolute path. There it is. That's where the files are actually stored currently. Um, OK, so now I say load data plus sage underscore y dot sage. And now I have this new function. And I can call it. OK, that's nice. And if I want to edit the file further, I can. Say instead of adding 1, I want to add 10. Save changes. Go back over here. Um, go back over here. Now, it shouldn't do anything because I haven't reloaded it. It should be exactly the same as before. But if I reevaluate the load block, then I should get a different answer. And indeed, I do. OK, so now you see how you could work on a file in one place and evaluate it in the other, entirely through the web. And you could do this with 10 different files or whatever. Um, if you had installed Sage locally on your laptop, this, this load line or an attached line in a minute could refer to any file on your laptop, on your computer. OK, so let's see. Um, let me show you attach, because that's kind of a little more magical. So attach data plus sage underscore y dot sage. Now what should happen is I can call this. And now if I go over here and change something, let me add a 2012 to the number. OK, click Save Changes. It should be the case that when I reevaluate this, Without having loaded, without having done anything explicitly, it should reload the code. Oh, great. There is a. Hmm. This is clearly a bug in the notebook version that I'm running on my laptop. Because it obviously shouldn't get into a maximum recursion depth trying to parse the file. I like running very new experimental code on my laptop. Um, let's try taking this worksheet and just putting it on the public notebook server. Because um, I'm kind of curious if the same bug is there. Shouldn't be. Yeah. What? Yeah, there was this little thing where there are 500 uh, people using Sage about two hours ago. It was kind of disturbing. Um, <laughs> it should make you happy. Yeah, it does make me happy, but uh, yeah, the number of Visitors per day has gone up about a thousand in the last month, 
almost <laughs> doubled. It's getting really hammered. Um, so I got annoyed by that and did a little stuff to make it faster. But um, yeah, it was definitely slower about a couple of hours ago. I can also run another Sage. Um, I have an old version of Sage on here, which won't have that bug. Well, here it is. Okay, so upload worksheet. This illustrates something, though. It up, it, this will illustrate that the file comes along with the worksheet, which is an important thing to illustrate. I wonder how much. I can check. I can show you what the uh, how loaded the server is if you want to see. Only like 115 users right now. Okay, so choose file, um, downloads. I think I called it import because I'm illustrating importing and stuff like that. Did I call it that? No, it isn't. Import something completely different. Sorry. Okay. Illustration of load attach import. Oh, ha! Huh. Another, you can't put, that's another bug that apparently is there still. If you put slashes in the file name, then it confuses the, the slashes are also used in the file system. So that will confuse things. I remember this being reported and I thought it was fixed, but apparently not. This is just my laptop being slow. Great. Hmm. Well, I'll just try to upload this import one. I don't know if it's going to work or not, though. Kind of doubt it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh. All right, so that's going nowhere fast. Oh, there it is. Okay, so looks like it uploaded it, and we shall see shortly. Actually, in the meantime, let me make another file that ends in .py. So I can show you how import works in, as opposed to touch. Okay, so let's make a new file. I'll call it uh, foo.py. Upload or create file. Okay, it looks like the upload finished, by the way. Um, so now I have a file, foo.py. Okay, so data lists the file. This is at 40.sagemb.org. This list this um, illustrates that the file that we've attached Rather, or rather the, the data file comes along with the worksheet, as you can see here. Um, the data directory will be different now. So the output of data is something that was local to my laptop. The data directory on the public server is completely different, as you can see. Um, we can load our file, and we can try it out there. Now let's, try, let's try attach and see what happens. And remember, the thing that triggered the bug on my laptop was editing the file and then uh, attach led to some sort of weird recursive recursion. Um, so let's try editing that file. This is too slow. I'm a very impatient person. I'm sure you are too. Okay, so... Oops. Where's the content of the file? <laughs> I don't see anything in there. Oh, it's just, I see, it's, it's loading the editor and it's just slow to display, I think. Because the line numbers haven't appeared either. Ah, there it is. So there's the file, let's change something. Put a bunch of zeros there. 
save changes. And I attached this. So over here, once the changes have been saved, it should notice that the file changed and then reload everything automatically. Okay, so now the file's saved. And now let's try it again. Either we're going to get some terrifying maximum recursion depth and I'll excitedly get to report a bug or not. So there you are, that works. Um, the version that I'm running on my laptop, by the way, I just took the absolute bleeding edge version of the Sage notebook that we haven't released yet and started running it because I wanted to see if there are any bugs. Maybe I'd find them. I found one just now. So, but it, um, the version that you're using is more well tested and the version that comes with Sage is even more tested. And you'll see that it did notice the change and then automatically reloaded the file. Okay, so that's how it's supposed to work and that's how it does work. Unless you're using some bleeding edge version. Okay, so that's um, load and attach. And from the command line, everything again is exactly the same, except you don't have to mess with data under the data thing, because you just give the exact path to the file that you're working with. All right, so the other thing I wanted to show you is import. And I made a new file called foo.py. So it's a .py file instead of a .sage file. That means it's um, going to contain Python code. You're not allowed to... Uh, or any Sage code, you, anything from the Sage library you have to explicitly import to use, and the preparser isn't used at all. Um, that's the difference with uh, Python files. Yes, Andre. Exactly. It's exactly like that. Um, there's basically nothing that's there by default. Any function you want to use, you have to import. So just to illustrate that, f of a, b, c, well, first we can do this. Maybe, um, Let's do something where the preparser will surprise us, except it won't because we already know it's going to happen. So these are not sage integers, and so it's just going to. Um, this is just going to evaluate to zero, and that's going to be one, etc. So save changes. That's saved. Now let's go back to our worksheet. This is local on my laptop, um, and just right at the top, I'll put import foo. This is not going to work because foo is in a subdirectory with some funny name. So I'll show you how to deal with that in a second. This should fail saying that foo doesn't exist. Um, oh, it's still all messed up from that other issue. Let me start over. It should, it, should fail, it should fail saying that foo doesn't exist. But why is it not, why is it not failing? Fail! <laughs> hmm. Okay, maybe that isn't necessary. Maybe it, uh, okay, well, I guess it doesn't fail. Huh, hey, that's nice. <laughs> Apparently, um, the subtlety that foo is in a different directory doesn't cause any trouble at all because apparently somebody has uh, programmed stuff so that gets dealt with in a natural way. So never mind. One awkward thing has been resolved. Um, so this works fine. And notice, let's see, does the answer look right? So remember it was 1 times 2 times 3, 6. Uh, actually, 2 to 3, that should be, I think, 1 in pure Python. Seems like it's wrong. Should be 7. What is going on here? Probably I'm just confused. Um, usually when you're not sure whether specific... So very often, a very common problem people make when they're working with code is they think one function is being run and maybe a completely different one is being run. So. The first thing you should ever do when you're debugging code, if you're not absolutely certain that the code that you're looking at is really the code that's being run, is to print, print hi mom right at the top of the function. Even if you are absolutely certain, do it anyways, because um, it'll save you a lot of time. So if you're going to start messing with the code, make sure you know that the code you're messing with is really being run. Over here, there's one thing with import. Um, if you import a module and then import it again, nothing happens. The, Import only happens once. If you want to reload the code that's in that module, you have to use the reload command, which is a standard thing in Python. So I have to say reload foo. Module foo is now reloaded, and now I can try this. So it really is doing that. Um, am I being stupid? I mean, this line I thought should evaluate to, shouldn't be pre-parsed. It's obviously, maybe I'm just being stupid. A equals one. 
equals two, c equals three. Invalid syntax. What? Oh, no, but I don't have to do double star because it's supposed to be exclusive or. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I can do that. Okay, so set those variables. Syntax error. So I'm making a syntax error. I don't feel like I'm making a syntax error. Um, invalid syntax. Oh, it's okay. Of course, this is me. I really don't feel like I'm making a syntax error. What? Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of maybe uh I don't know. what's going on with this? This is confusing. Something's Yeah, well it should be one, two, and three. But you're right, let's print them out just to be sure. This one? Copy that carrot. Copy the carrot. Copy that code. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that symbol is something else? That means something that's. Oh. It looks the same. So there's some other operator or something that. Oh my god. Okay, that's subtle. Carrot symbol. True. No? <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, hold on. Okay. This is crazy. <laughs> well, I didn't. Okay, wait. So, percent Python. <laughs> Alright. This is baffling. All right, so these are the three things, right? Yeah. So I'll do print the first thing, comma the second thing, comma the third thing. Okay, so one of them is a syntax error. It's obviously not gonna be the first thing. I'm just using copy and paste every time. So I'll try that, copied and pasted. Okay, and now this last thing is the one that's supposed to be the syntax error. Okay, so there's something wrong with that. Telling me it's the carrot. So the carrot, something's, something funny is happening with the code over here because of tiny, the, or whatever, code mirror, this editor. I see. So copy and paste in this editor is very disturbing. So obviously, if I delete this and I hit the character symbol or the carrot symbol, it's still invalid syntax. Okay, so let me try a three. Nope. Must be a hidden character at the end of the. Ah, there was a there was an invisible character. I hit re, I hit backspace twice, and only once did a character get deleted. There's an invisible character at the end of this line. Watch, listen. The cursor did not move. So now, if I hit evaluate, I don't know, but this is this is deeply disturbing. Yeah, it's pretty scary because it's actually giving the wrong number, because it's somehow, uh, wow, this is terrifying. <laughs> I mean, think about it, it's giving, mathematically, it's giving back 11, because this last thing is somehow getting, this is really bad, this last three is getting evaluated as something completely different. It's literally a different number, and you're sort of silently getting a terrifyingly wrong mathematical answer. Wow. Uh, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm worried. I just want to have it do return two, three, and see what it does. Okay.
okay, I might get one. Oh, we should call it G. I just don't want this to magically go away. That would be the worst. Okay, so that's the. Wow. So somehow. Some of that comes out to 11. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Hey, that's a very good point. So, this, this is a sage integer. Because I'm giving it sage integer input. That is just a Python integer 0, so it's ignored. That should still be 7. Although, I'm very curious what happens if I make them all sage integers. Although, I, I should. Eleven. What? Is it really the number eleven? Is that really eleven? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, you tested it there. Okay, so somewhere there's a hidden character at the end. Causing this to. Yeah. Uh, G of ABC. I could. Um, that would be interesting to see. Okay, so, because that should be the same as 2 carat 3. Trying again, see what happens. Huh. Okay, let me change it back. I really hope it's wrong again. So all I do is just change it back. Reload. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's horrible. Just horrible. And yet I can't... It must have to do with the plus and something to do with HTML back and forth conversions. Because plus is a dangerous thing when you're working with web applications. Um, I'm guessing the plus is relevant. I bet the, the plus is getting changed to some other thing which is a different operator. Wow, that's really terrifying. Let's see what happens here. One. Dang it. That doesn't illustrate anything. Try that. Truly really terrified. 11, okay. So I think I can get rid of the thing in the middle. Let's try, okay, 6 plus 2, 3. So it should be 7, but it's coming out as 11. So, what did you, how do you say? So I want to see exactly what, um, yeah. Actually, wait, I know what I can do. This, this is just a file on my computer. So it appears in the web browser, but there's actually a file saved on my computer. I could just look inside of it with the command prompt, because this is my own, web, my own copy of Sage. That would be an easy way to do this, because it's just sitting in this directory data, which is right there. Sorry, that'll be, then I can avoid having to do that. Um, there's the file, foo.py. There's a plus. Import foo, foo.g of 123. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Um, yeah. Then you get this. Ah, uh, hey, have you ever heard of order of operations? Yeah. Maybe we're just being stupid. <laughs> There's no bugs anywhere, except in my brain. Uh, well, <laughs> and everybody else's. There's the, a bug in no, the sense you would not think that plus right, numbers. But there are, there's a little table. Every programming language has the order of operations. It's like when you're 
Has anybody take like a basic course in CS and like programming and the first thing they pound into is like multiplication is a higher precedence than addition? I remember that being pounded in my head like 20 years ago. Um, apparently, exclusive or has a very low precedence, even lower than plus. So that's what confused us for this entire thing. In contrast to double star, which has a very high precedence. So let's just confirm that. Um, Python .or, or Python precedence rules of operators, I guess. So the official Python language definition. You have to choose something or you end up requiring the user to put an enormous number of parentheses everywhere, which uh, is only okay if they're writing Lisp. So um, here we are. Uh, operations or order precedence. That's what I want. Precedence. All right, so this is a table which is telling us the precedence of operators. And um, caret is above plus. So it's like, first it, it does stuff at the bottom first and then it works its way up. If you have a big expression in a programming language and it doesn't have any parentheses or it doesn't have enough parentheses, then the programming language will parse it in some way. Or in some languages like Maple, as we saw before, it'll just give you a big error saying, give me more parentheses. But in Python, it uses this table. And it says, oh, if I see star star for exponentiation, that you know I do that before I'm going to deal with pluses and times and, and single stars. And it deals with this bitwise exclusive or. By the way, if you don't know what XOR is, so you write your number in binary, and then you write the other number in binary. And so if you were looking at, what was it? Two to the power of three. So two. Oops, 2 in binary is 1, 0. 3 in binary is 1, 1. What it does is it, it makes a new number everywhere. You, if you have both 1s, then it makes a 0. And if you have only exactly one 1, then you get a 1. So that's the exclusive or of two bit strings. And that gives us back, this is the number 1 in binary. So this is a very useful operator to have in uh, computer programming. And it has a very, very whatever it means to be at the top of this precedence. And I didn't realize that at all, and therefore I got totally tripped up, and there's no bugs at all anywhere here. <laughs> there's no like funny characters doing stuff to change it or whatever. Um, so uh, I hope you learned something just now, rather than, I, I certainly learned something, rather than just feeling like this is a disorganized mess of a lecture. Uh, there was something, yes, there was a, there was a mysterious character. Uh, I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, you can try to figure out what it is. Let's see. Um, okay, so let me just try to let me see if I can find that extra character. Hmm. I'm not gonna. Well, it didn't cause anything to change, so um, it was it was white space. <laughs> could it, it could have been just how. How the uh, how hitting delete works the first time you go into a cell or something like that, I don't know. I don't know for sure that there was actually an extra character rather than just that when I hit delete once the very first time I was in the cell maybe it doesn't back up or something funny like that. Okay, so um, so you've seen import and you've seen that you can write Python code and you've seen that if you're um, that if you are not careful you may end up writing Python code that does something different than what you expect, um, but that is possible to figure it out. And um, and you've seen each of load, import, and attach in action. Okay, so I think that we've conclude we've finished this step one of the plan for today. Any questions? And I think we've discovered no bugs at all, except in a bleeding edge local copy of my notebook, which kind of doesn't count because it's not released at all. Okay, so that was right here. It was certainly a slightly awkward experience for me explaining all that, um, <laughs> but I hope you've learned something and, um, uh, and so on. Okay, changing the Sage library and seeing the results. All right, so um, we're nearly out of time, so I can't really do very much with these two things, but I'll try to do something very quickly. Um, so remember when we edited the Python source code and uh, got it to do something funny. Oops, not that. So let's just, I'm just going to choose something in the Sage library, 
change it and then see the behavior of sage change. Okay? And uh, I don't know, let's see. Anyone want to, anybody, can anybody think of a function in sage? What? Factorial. Factorial, okay. So there's a function in sage called factorial. Um, I think it's in this directory. And yep, it looks like it's in uh, arith.py. So let's change factorial so it does something goofy. So I'm editing the file um, arith.py. And what I'm going to do next, by the way, as soon as we come in on Friday, is there's a whole bunch of directories here with sage code in them, with, in fact, a half million lines of sage code. I'm going to go through and, for some of the directories, tell you something about them. Um, some of them involve very advanced mathematics. So that will be aimed more at the grad students, and some of it will not. Um, so that's what we'll do at the beginning next time. But let's do something to the factorial function. So here is the, I'll turn off syntax highlighting in case it's making it hard to see. Actually, yeah, that's definitely hard to see. So here's the factorial function. So a function takes as input something and returns the factorial of that something. And let's just go find the actual implementation. So here's what it does. If the number is negative, it gives an error. If the if it otherwise it turns the number into an integer and then calls the factorial that's defined in GMP. And finally it'll call Perry. So that's all factorial does. It just hands the question off to some other system. Um, you could imagine, for example, maybe coming up with a definition of factorial for polynomials over a finite field. I don't know. If you did that, then you would want to put the code right here. Okay? Um, let's, let's come up with a definition of factorial for negative numbers and implement it really quickly. What do you want it to be? Okay. <laughs> Return 100. All right. Now, um, if you want to... If you've modified Sage, that has modified any of the files in any of these directories involving either Python or Cython, which we haven't discussed much, um, what you do is you type Sage space dash BR. What it will do is it will look to see if any files have changed. Any files that have changed, it will reinstall them in the right place. Then it will start up Sage, ready to go with the new version of um, your code. So let's try out factorial. First on a usual number, and now let's try it on a negative number and see what happens. Hmm, we still got the same error message. Weird. Um, <laughs> what if that code isn't being read? So it didn't print that hi mom thing, so we know it's not being run. Um, let me try one other thing. Hmm. Wow, it literally is not running that code. Sage. Arith. Sage. Or rings. Arith. Oh. All right. So I explicitly imported that function, and then it worked. Apparently, there is another function called factorial somewhere else in Sage that is shadowing that one I just edited. And that's what, what, what happened. OK, so there's another file that contains a function called factorial. When you start up Sage, it's that factorial that's being run. The one that's in this file that I just edited is actually not run when you start up Sage by default. Somebody wrote it, left it laying around, and forgot to delete it when they replaced it by a newer, different version. So that is. Uh, lame, actually. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, what if you, in the file that you wrote, in the idea, so you yeah. write two functions with yeah. the same name? Yeah, the second one will overwrite the first one. All right. And, and the Python and, uh, interpreter reads it. Okay. It's as if the first one didn't exist. Okay, and about the... And it won't give you an error. we will just okay, silently yeah. do that. In fact, it's another, I, the first thing I suspected here was that maybe there were two factorials in this file, mm -hmm. and that right after the one that I had oh, edited... Oh, file that the, got called. Yeah. Right. This right. one wasn't even imported at all, but... It could have been that somebody just wrote another factorial right after this one, and that's the one that would get called. Okay. Uh, do you have a question? Let me, uh, let me stop my screen capture before I unplug it or bad things will happen. Um, just, I just have to do this. How do I stop it? Stop screen recording.